So in this lecture, we're going to introduce a topic called the direct stiffness method. It's based on calculating displacements using stiffness of elements, and it's the main method used in most commercial structural analysis packages available on the market. The three great things about this method is it's applicable to both statically indeterminate structures as well as determinate structures. It's ideal for computer implementation and it's the method is repeatable and very automatable. So even if you didn't enjoy computer programming yourself, somebody else will have enjoyed computer programming and program the method that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis and avoid laborious hand calculations and as you'll have became very aware of the ease that you can have in making mistakes as you make hand calculations because we've all got signs and cosines mixed up or minus signs in the past okay so the method is really based on one simple equation we're going to show it first of all for trusses then frames but it's also applicable for solids as well and the main equation that we need to consider is and we're going to write it in matrix format. So K, which is a stiffness matrix, multiplied by U, which is a vector of displacements, is equal to F, a vector of forces or external forces. So let's just write that down for you. So we've got the stiffness multiplied by displacement equals force and this is a well-known equation in a scalar format but now we're extending the ideas into a matrix format okay so what we're going to do is move on to truss elements and we're going to just look first of all at an element in 1d so what we're going to do is consider one bar within a truss and so we have one truss bar and at the ends of the bar what would be joints in the method of joints we're going to call these things from now on we're going to call them nodes and at the left hand end we have node one at the right hand end we have node two the length of this truss element we're going to call L and we're also going to note that at node 1 we can have a displacement in a positive x direction of u1 and at node 2 we can have a displacement in the positive x direction again of u2 it's also possible that this bar could be subject to to external forces and so at node 1 we can have an external force F1 again in the positive X direction and a force F2 in the positive X direction at node 2 on the right hand side what we're going to do now is with this element is we're going to split this into the free body diagrams for the bar on its own and the nodes on their own so first of all we're going to take node 1 and we're going to draw the free body diagram for node 1 so if I have node 1 and put a 1 there just to show what it is the node can have the external force acting upon it F1 and if we presume the bar to be in tension the node will have to be pulling the bar if the node if the bar is being pulled we need to have an equal and opposite force the normal force in the bar acting on the node and we'll make this a little bit clearer in a minute when we draw the free body diagram for the bar on its own so the bar on its own And now, if this is going to be in tension, 
the bar would need to be subject to two external forces at either end and we're going to call this n for the normal force in the bar and that would put the bar in tension and we're always going to be considering tension to be positive and so this note this normal force n here needs to be balanced so this is pointing to the left to give you tension it needs to be balanced on the node by a normal force in the opposite direction so pointing to the right and we have a similar situation when we draw the free body diagram for node 2 at the right hand side of the bar and we'll draw on the forces on that so if we have a normal force n pointing to the right on the bar we need to have a normal force n pointing to the left on node 2 and again positive x direction we can have an external force f2 on that node and the nodes themselves are capable of undergoing displacements and we'll draw the potential displacement of the bar u1 or the node u1 and the potential displacement of the node 2 which would be u2 so that's node 2 so from strength of materials now we know that the normal force n must be equal to the area of the bar the cross-sectional area multiplied by the stress in that bar again from what we know strength of materials we've still got the cross-sectional area we can convert the stress sigma into Young's modulus times by the strain epsilon and furthermore one other thing we can take from the simple expression of strain that is that the change in length of an element divided by the original length of the element is the strain so let's write that just to the side equals delta l divided by l and we're going to rewrite that in terms of the displacements u2 and u1 so delta l we're going to re-express but first of all we've got cross-sectional area multiplied by young's modulus multiplied by the strain and the strain we could say is u2 minus u1 divided by the original length of the element l and finally i'm going to rewrite this equation just rearranging it slightly in, into a format that will be useful later that n equals a e divided by l multiply by u2 minus u1 so only just a slight rearrangement of the equation above okay so now we have this what we're going to do is consider the equilibrium of the nodes themselves in isolation so having a look at now this free body diagram for node one we're going to consider the equilibrium so we know that f1 plus n must be equal to zero so if we write that down the equilibrium of node one gives us f1 must be equal to minus n and we know from above that n was a e divided by l so let's write that down a e divided by l and now we have the minus sign so i'm going to change this term here in the brackets to to take care of the minus sign is u1 minus u2 
and we're going to do similar for the equilibrium of node 2. So in this case, we had the external force F2 was equal to plus N. So going in the positive X direction. And again, we're going to write it in a similar format to what we did for above. And we have A, E divided by L brackets. And we're going to slightly different we're going to keep the minus sign there, but we've got minus U1 plus U2. So we've got the U1 at the front. That's the only thing I've done slightly different from the equation we wrote here. So we have two equations in terms of the external forces and the unknown displacements. The external forces would be specified. And what we're going to do is take these two equations and we're going to write them in matrix notation so in matrix notation we get so a e divided by l multiplied by and we want for we'll just set out the brackets we're going to have u1 as our unknown u2 as our unknown and for node 1, we want a plus U1, but a minus U2. So a plus U1, but a minus U2. And for our second equation for U2, or for F2, we're going to have a minus U1, but a plus U2. And our right-hand side becomes the force F1 and the force F2. So you could look at each row of this equation here individually. So you've got AE divided by L 1 times U1 minus U2 so 1 times U1 minus U2 equals F1. And then you can look at the second row of the equation similarly and you've got a my AE divided by L minus U1 plus U2 is equal to F2. And this equation is really important. We've set out the KU equals F like we did earlier. So write that down in short. KU equals F. Stiffness times displacement equals force. And so, looking, comparing the two, all of this term here, the AE over L1 minus 1 minus 1, 1, is what we're going to call an element stiffness matrix. And it's really useful. This applies to all bars that we're ever going to encounter. This stiffness matrix is common for every bar. The only thing that might change are the properties of the bar, the cross-sectional area, the Young's modulus, or the length of the bar. At this moment in time, we're only considering bars that can act in an X direction. And we'll go on later to consider... Uh, ways that we can transform this stiffness matrix into two dimensions and possibly three dimensions for later. So what we're going to do is move on to an example of how we use this bar stiffness in a more practical application and have a system of equations we can solve for a one-dimensional truss system.